tonight we're back in First Kings. Uh, tonight we'll be in chapter 17, so if you want to be finding your way there. And just as a, a, a matter of uh, touching base with where we were last week to, to bring us to where we are tonight, just a little background, just a reminder of what we looked at last week. We, we uh, talked about last week how the title of last week's sermon was Evil Begets Evil, and we kind of focused on the lineage of, of Ahab and his father before him and just that lineage of, of rotten kings that basically Israel had one after another. The, the kingdom was divided at this time that you had Israel in the north and Judah to the south and uh, you know just a, just a one after another of, of one king after another. We found out that there were uh, 39 kings during the divided kingdom and only four of those were, were seen or, or labeled as being good kings and uh, we had King uh, Ahab was now uh, over Israel, and, and, and he set up his capital in the city of Samaria for his whole reign. And uh, we also learned that he had married to Jezebel, and we found out that Jezebel uh, uh, come from a foreign land, and maybe there there was an arranged marriage in, in those days where you would have a nobility from, from one uh, nation marrying to another nation to to kind of have a coalition of, of for power, and so you would exchange daughters and prin- you know have a princess or a prince and those things. But sometimes when you do those things, you're 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 getting in bed with the devil, is is what's happening. You're starting to bring things into your kingdom that you maybe never intended to, and that's what happened here. Because with Jezebel comes Baal and Baal worship, and then she had a very strong influence on Ahab, and so now we see the rise of Baal worship is prevalent. In, in, uh, in northern kingdom and Ahab is just letting it letting it roll he's not only letting it roll he's he's instigating it he's set up temples now where you can worship Baal and he's he's he's, he's allowing the people or, or encouraging the people to worship Baal in the temple set up in Samaria and not go to Jerusalem anymore to worship at the temple of the one true God and so that's a big problem uh, for the people of Israel that's a big problem for God and God won't have it and so God this week we'll see is going to raise up a prophet a prophet to, to step in and intercede and to say no more uh, to Ahab and Jezebel, that, that God has a response for those two. And so this evening we're going to be introduced to our main human character for the next several weeks. And I say it, the, the main character, main human character, because we all know that God is the main character of Scripture. Amen? He's the main, he's the star of the show. From, from cover to cover, God is the, the star of the Bible. He's the main character. And so uh, our human character, our star, he is Elijah. His name is Elijah, and he's the prophet of the one true God, Yahweh. And, and it's funny, if you, if you know, if you have some study notes in your Bible, you have a good study Bible, you'll see there that Elijah's name actually means Yahweh is my God. So he's, he's actually living out. His name actually means who he is. All right, so names in the Old Testament tend to have meaning, whereas our names now today have little meaning. Our names pretty much just whatever's popular or whatever sounds good or whatever, you know, rolls off our tongues or whatever comes and fits our fancy. But in those days, names were profound. They had meaning. So what exactly is a prophet? I think we might need to touch on that a little bit too before we move into our text because some, some confusion abounds. Some thinks that a prophet is kind of like a, a genie or a fortune teller, and that's not the case. Uh, for the most part, they were just like you and me. They were They were just flesh and blood they weren't supernatural they were gifted in supernatural ways but they were just men set apart for god for this purpose you know they had needs they felt pain they got lonely they were just human they were men just like we are and these were individuals that that were just set apart to speak on god's behalf uh they weren't all knowing but they were all telling you'll see the difference they weren't all knowing, but they were all telling. That's what they did. Prophets are forth tellers, not fortune tellers. Forth tellers, not fortune tellers. That's a, that's a huge difference. Prophets don't make predictions. They make pronouncements. Prophets don't make predictions. They make pronouncements. And so in ancient times, the, the, the test of a genuine prophet was whether or not his prophecy would come true or not. You know what happened to a prophet whose prophecies didn't come to pass? He wasn't a prophet much longer. He wasn't alive much longer either. So it was a serious thing to be, be known as a prophet and to be a true prophet. And typically, typically what God would do for his prophets is that he would accompany them with miracles, signs, and wonders. And we see that throughout the Old Testament. Uh, and so often they would be a living parable to demonstrate God's message for Israel. And that was kind of a, 
uh, you know, if you read the Old Testament and you kind of, I mean, the, the, the major prophets, I mean, they're big, thick books, and that's why they're called major prophets. It's not that they did anything special or minor prophets did things that weren't special. The, the, the difference between major prophets and minor prophets is the number of pages. That's it. There's nothing more significant than that. But as you read some of these prophets, man, you feel, you feel for them. They had a rough go of it that you can imagine they're being called out by God to be their prophet. You know, if someone probably had to say, oh, no. Oh, no, I, I, I don't want this. I don't put this. Don't put this mantle on me. I've heard of what happens to your prophets, God. And, I, and it's, it's a tough life to live because the, the prophets, they weren't they weren't the most popular of folks. You know, because usually when they come around and they bring a pronouncement of God, a lot of times it was a it was a rebuke because of the people were living uh, apart from God or they were worshiping false gods. And, and usually they would come and bring warnings of judgments and a call to repentance. I guess for you and I, or, or maybe me more particularly as a, as a pastor, when I preach God's word, people don't tend to respond real well to rebukes, or they don't, don't tend to respond to when you, when you bring up sin or a call to repentance. They don't care too much for that. So these guys weren't really uh, asked over for dinner too much, is what I'm trying to say, that prophets weren't, weren't real popular. And, and God would do some, some, some peculiar things with them. And, and I said already that he would have them live out a parable from time to time. Just think about if you are familiar with the book of Hosea. All right, the book of Hosea is a great example of that. You know, the prophet of God, the man of God. All right, he's the, a holy man. And, and what did God do for the prophet Hosea? Who did he tell Hosea to marry? <laughs> Gomer, right? A prostitute. A prostitute named Gomer. Wow, how about that? All that was for was a display of, of his relationship with Israel, Right? That's, that's the whole purpose that was behind there, a visual play on words, a, a living it out. A, a living parable was what the purpose of, of Hosea, right? Hosea was to can, continue to love her and receive her back whenever she was unfaithful to him to demonstrate God's love for Israel. Life for a prophet was difficult, to say the least. Let's take a look at our text for this evening. We're going to look at the first seven verses of uh, 1 Kings 17. And verse 1 begins, And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Get away from here, and turn eastward, and hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan, and it will be that you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and stayed by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. And it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Father, we are again humbled uh, to the privilege of being able to have a copy of your word, Father. I pray that tonight uh, we would ring this, this passage out, Father, that you would open our eyes to the beautiful truths that are here, Father, for us to learn from the, the life lessons from Elijah, God, that we can glean some things from him, Father, that we would understand who we are a little better, but more importantly, we would understand who you are a little better. Father, affect us greatly tonight by this word, and we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so the first thing that we see, all right, the, the title of, our, of our, our sermon tonight was to expect the unexpected. And, and the first unexpected thing that we can see is that God can use unexpected methods. All right, have you figured that out? Have you experienced that in your own life, that, that God tends to not always cooperate with us in the way we think he should? That God, <laughs> just when you think you have God figured out, he throws you a curveball? That, that God just refuses to stay in that little box that we want to keep him in? That just when we think we know that God is surely going to act this way, he goes the opposite direction? You know how you, you want to assure yourself of God moving a, a, against what you say? Try this. Say, I will never, and then fill in the blank. Fill in the blank, and God says, challenge accepted, right? I will never teach this. I'll never go there. I'll never whatever, and I promise you that, that God will win that. God will turn that around. Whatever you say you won't do, he'll be sure to make sure that you do it. So let's see what, uh, what's going on here with Elijah, this unexpected method that 
Uh, we see in the text. He says in, in verse 1, And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall be, uh, no, not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. Hmm. So we know from reading our Old Testament that, that God would eventually raise up the Babylonians and the Assyrians to bring judgment on both uh, the kingdoms for their worship of false gods, right? We know that. We kind of covered that a little bit last week. But before he would do that, he would use one faithful man, not an army, right? One faithful man, not an army. He didn't, you know, a great force at this time. He sent one man, not an army. That's an unusual. It's unexpected. You would think that that would force that God would turn things around, but he didn't do that. And so we have Elijah comes onto the scene. We know very little about Elijah. All we really have is right here in verse 1. This is all we know uh, the, for background. That's all we have on him. And historians are unclear of where uh, Tishbe is located. We don't even know. Like they argue about where it might be, but there's really no, really no clear indication. There is no uh, monument set up. There's no gift shop. If you ever take a tour of the Middle East or the Holy Land, you won't have a gift shop that, say, that sells, you know, T-shirt says, Elijah lived here. You won't be able to find that place. Or if you do find that place, they're, they're not being truthful because nobody really knows where that place is located at. Uh, some would suggest that it's located along the path uh, of, the, of the, the brook Cherith there, which would kind of make sense, but that's a pretty broad region. That's a pretty large area to say that, that he would come from. So we really don't know. And, and then Gilead is, is basically a large area. It's a region east of the Jordan River, that's opposite from Samaria. So just to kind of get your mind, uh, just a picture of the landscape here is what I'm, what I'm trying to do for us uh, uh, now. And uh, ultimately, none of that really matters, right? It, it, none of that really matters, if, if, you know, who, got, who he was, where he came from, where his hometown was, what his favorite ice cream was. Really, none of that really matters at the end of the day. Right? Elijah was just a man that God set apart to be used for his purposes. That's it. That's all you need to know. Right? From, from, I used to watch wrestling. I was just telling myself a little bit uh, when I was younger, back when wrestling was real. Y'all know it's real, right? Y'all, y'all know that? Back in the day, it was real. Mid-South wrestling was, was legit, right? In, in the Coliseum in Alexandria, it used to go down. And uh, I remember, I can't remember who, what wrestler it was, but his, his designation said he was from parts unknown. Right? From parts unknown. So just say that about Elijah from parts unknown. We're not sure where he's from, but we just know that God used him in a profound way. And his life was marked by obedience. Ain't that something? Haven't we talked about that? Like just ad nauseum over and over again. We see that trait in the life of people that God uses, obedience, over and over again. So here we go again. Surely he left his old life to do what the Lord had for him to do. Right? We have no clue of what he did before he became a prophet. We don't know. We don't have any idea. But we do know he had to travel a good ways to, to be at the center of bell worship to deliver God's message. That had to take some courage, wouldn't it? To, to, to you're going to the belly of the beast, if you will, to pronounce this message. And it had to be a fearful thing to approach a king with bad news. And we just have to go no further to be reminded of the book of Esther. Right? And, of course, that was a pagan king, but a king, nonetheless, uh, are, are not, not prone to, to be real uh, receptive of bad news. They want to have nothing but good news before them. And so it's a dangerous thing to approach a king with bad news. But yet here Elijah walked straight up to him and brought it, right? Bad news is one thing. How much worse is it that you're going to bring a promise of judgment? Right? It's even worse. So he had to be walking by faith and not by sight. I think that's another good point for us, that we need to be reminded to do the same things, to walk by faith and not by sight. And so uh, let's look at this, this judgment against Ahab, this judgment against Ahab. And, and if you notice, it was specifically targeted at Baal, because last week we talked about Baal being the god of the storm. He was the god of the storm. He's the one who was responsible for bringing the rain for the harvest. And so it wasn't just some happenstance. It wasn't some random judgment. It was something that was kind of poking Baal right in the chest and saying, Yahweh is saying, I'm the true God and you're a fraud. And I'll prove it because I'm going to say no rain or dew. And, and, and until I say so, it won't happen. So if you're the true God and you're the God of the rain, the God of the storm, then make it happen. And it won't. Just put your umbrellas up for three years. I'm saying it now. Right? Mark it down. God says no rain, no dew. 
Just put them up. Your, your, your umbrellas are going to dry rot by the time you need them again. Right? Mark it. And that's what, exactly what happened. So by pronouncing a complete drought in the land, it was showing that Yahweh was in charge of the rain and not Baal. Now, here's a peculiar thing I found when I was studying. And, and we, we think some crazy stuff, too. I'm just going to just be honest with you. Our beliefs, even as Christians, are, some, are, are odd to the normal person. But these things that the, the followers of Baal would do really kind of make you scratch your head. They would justify uh, the dry season as being when th- that their god, Baal, would die often. And so he, w- he would die and would have to be brought back to life to bring the rain. So their god was uh, as capable of dying. He would actually die and have to come back to life. And so when you have a drought, that's how they explained it away. That, oh, oh Baal's dead. We, got, we have to start leaping about, dancing, and having our, like when we have, when we, in a few weeks we'll get to the, the showdown, uh, uh, you know, with, between the prophets of Baal and Elijah. Remember how they leaped about and sang and, and cut themselves and made all that noise. And they were trying to bring their God back to life. It's what they were trying to do. And so that's a crazy thing to think that, first of all, I'm not, we don't worship a dead God. Amen? We, we worship a living God who never, you, you know, Jesus died on the cross. But, but God the Father, God the Trinity does not die. Everlasting to everlasting. And so uh, the, the comparison between Baal and God are, are, are tremendous. And so it's funny that they would actually think these things. That's just how they would normally, normally justify when no rain would come. So in contrast, we have a living God. We serve a living God. And the true God will demonstrate that he rules the rain and not Baal. So the lesson for us from this God's methods aren't always what we expect. Right? God's methods aren't always as we expect or what we expect. Because the Apostle Paul spoke of this mystery of how God operates in the New Testament in a couple of places. He wrote in Romans eleven thirty four, he says, For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Now, does anybody in here besides me like to try to give God some advice every now and then, make some suggestions to the Lord about how he might proceed in some matters. Yeah, ain't that silly? But we do it. We keep doing it, right? Look, God, I know you got this under control, but have you considered this? Yeah, I can just imagine God sitting there with his arms crossed. Really? Tell me about this, this thing that you think I should do, right? Hmm kind of funny we do these things we're silly we're silly humans and then first corinthians two sixteen says something similar it says for who has understood the mind of the lord so as to instruct him but we have the mind of christ be sure whatever method that god uses it will accomplish his purposes whatever method whatever method whatever means right outside the box thinking Whatever it is, it will accomplish its purposes. Be sure of that. The second thing we see in our passage tonight is that God gives unexpected directions. God gives unexpected directions. Verses 2 and 3. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. Can you imagine that, that, that Elijah was kind of having a say what moment, right? Say, what? I just, I just came, I just walked into the throne room of King Ahab and, and dropped this judgment, and now you're telling me to run and hide. That's basically what, that's what it says, right? That's what the text says, and, and, and he had to be thinking, what is this? You would expect for Elijah to be standing there with his chest all puffed out in defiance of the king, but God had other plans for Elijah. God had other plans for Elijah. And God will always make sure that he he is the one to be glorified. That's what it's about. That's really what this is all about, that he's just the messenger. It wasn't that that Elijah was bold and that Elijah was awesome. It was that God is bold and God is awesome, right? He brings the message and departs and gets out of there. This this is to be known that this isn't because Elijah. It's not because of Elijah's word that there's no rain. It's because the word of the God says there's no rain. And so he says his part and beat it, right? Beat the street, be gone. And not to mention, we also see the real human aspect of it, that, that, that Elijah were to remain there. What would happen to Elijah? 
he'd be killed. There would be no more Elijah. There would be no more tales of Elijah. Elijah would, would, would enter in verse 1 and be gone in verse 2. Right? He would have brought his, brought his judgment and made his pronouncement. And, and next thing you know, we'd be reading about his skull being placed on a wall somewhere. Right? So it's, uh, he had a way, uh, God had a way for him that, that, that we wanted to make sure that the people would know that Elijah wasn't the threat. God was. Right? So he had a method here, and he had some unusual directions. And uh, we have another example of this type of thing that, that, uh, that God using these unexpected directions can be found in the account of Gideon. If you're familiar with the story of Gideon, which is quite peculiar, and, and, and uh, we think of the, the challenge of the fleece, right, the, the dew and be damp, the ground would be damp, or the fleece would be damp, and vice versa. And we see God's patience as he allowed for, for Gideon to test him, right? And we... Because sometimes we, we, we kind of beat ourselves up when we have seasons of doubt. And, and Gideon had great doubt. And Gideon went so far as to challenge God to prove to me that what you're saying is true. And, and God was, was respectful that. God responded. God actually responded to him in a way that would appease him. And so we, we see that, that uh, at this time with Gideon, uh, they were the, they were, he was trying to amass an army that would, would run off or the invading Midianites. Uh, that, that kept making uh, uh, raids into uh, their country and taking their crops and was, you know, more or less pushing them around. And so they finally had enough. And so Gideon was raising up an army, and he had raised up quite a large army at this time. But God had other plans, that, that God had raised up Gideon uh, as a judge to deliver his people. But he had to deliver, to deliver God's people God's way. Right? There was going to be no large show of force that, that God had an idea that we're going, to, we're going to dwindle this army down. That army is way too large, right? Uh, uh, you know, you could win. You, there's no doubt you could win with an army this large. But when you win the battle, God gets no glory. That was the whole point, that God was not going to have any glory. If you send an army of 40,000, 50,000 people to take on the Midianites, Right, just sheer numbers. You're going to have this, and he says that's not what this is about. That, that God is not going to share His glory with anyone. And so, flip over into your Bibles to Judges chapter seven. Judges chapter seven, and we'll we'll look at a couple of verses here to see this. It's an amazing account how God will work. So when you think about how God gives us some unexpected instructions, uh, this is, definitely fits that bill. Judges chapter seven, verses two through seven. It says, the Lord said to Gideon, the people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel boast over me, saying, my own hand has saved me. Now, therefore, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, whoever is fearful and trembling, let, them, let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead. Then 22,000 of the people returned and 10,000 remained. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. Take them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. And any one of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, shall go with you. And any one of whom I say to go, or of any one who I say to you, uh, this one shall not go with you, shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, Everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall uh, set uh, by himself. Likewise, everyone who kneels down to drink, and you, uh, and you, and the number of those who lapped, putting their hands to their mouths, was three hundred men. But all the rest of the people knelt down to drink water. And the Lord said to Gideon, "With the three hundred men who who lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hand, and let all the, let all the others go, every man to his home." Right. Too many, down to three hundred. Right. We started out with what do we have? Twenty two thousand to begin with. Then 10,000, and then, then we had another 600 or so, and so we're just dwindling down to 300. It was all about God getting the glory. All right? You went back up there into verse 2. He said, lest Israel boast over me. And God's not going to have that. He wants to make sure that, that, that uh, Israel knows, make sure Ahab knows, make sure Jezebel knows that, that, that Yahweh is the one true God, that Baal's a punk and a phony. Right? And so he will not share his glory with anyone. So God's unexpected directions to Elijah were to run and hide. Right? God basically told Elijah to get out of there before the king is going to kill you. And so repeatedly, we see that Elijah lived his, his life in response to, to God's authority. 
Right? He responded to the word of the Lord. Over and over again, we'll see that in the text. As the word of the Lord says, and then we see Elijah moving and responding. But God wasn't done with Elijah just yet. But he needed to follow God's instructions for this all to work out. It had to be done God's way. So uh, just to uh, pause a second and ask a couple of questions of you to ponder about. We keep on looking at Elijah, but if we don't bring this down to a level where we apply it to our own lives, it's kind of pointless, right? It will just have some information that's kind of historically accurate, but uh, won't be much beneficial to us. So how good are you at following directions? All right, how good are you at following directions? Do you think following the directions is optional? Right? We, we talk, men, we talk about it quite a bit. You know, on Sunday mornings and Sunday school, we talk about that, how, um, you know, can't speak for ladies, but I know for, for men, a lot of times we get, we get you know, projects and we'll get a, a, a new grill or going to put together a swing set and they come with this manual, right? And we like, we don't need that. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a swing set. How, how hard can this be, Right? And by the time you're done, you got a whole bunch of spare parts. You know, like, and that's how you write it off. It's just spare parts. I guess we, you know, in case we, later on, we might need those things. But you find out, you put it together wrong. And it probably took you a lot longer than it should have. Because you have to back out bolts that you shouldn't have put in certain places. And sometimes you got to, it's a mess, right? When you don't follow the directions, you have problems. All right, skipping the directions may not be too big of a, bill, uh, too big of a deal when you're putting together a swing set. But following the directions means everything when God is the one giving the directions, right? That's a big difference. So here we have the Word of God. When He gives us directions, we need to follow them. So Elijah's story would have uh, would have a much different end if he failed to follow the directions the Lord gave him, um, because we see that there were some specifics given in our text in those couple of verses. There are some sp- specific things that God had said. He said when when God gives us specific instructions. He does it for a reason because sometimes we just have general things in Scripture, right? Just some general rules of thumb and some general principles that are there. But sometimes he says things specifically, and then we need to follow them specifically. Right? He, was told, uh, he was told to head to a specific direction and to a specific place. He's told to head east and also to the brick chair, both very specific. And so when we follow the Lord's specific instructions, life is as it should be. And when we fail to follow the Lord's specific instructions, life is not as it should be. I think we can all identify with that, right? That, that we would say that I, I, you know, I've tried to do it my own way, and it didn't work out so well. I think that's where a lot of the problems with our, our, our culture where it is now, when we try to redefine marriage, that's a great example where uh, marriage can be whatever you want it to be, or, or marriage is optional. We can just cohabitate, you know, and that's not God's design. It's not God's way, and, and it, He will not honor it. It will not be successful. It just, it just won't. And so for all of us, it's the same line of thought. When God gives us specific instructions, we need to respond to those specific instructions. Because what was going on here was that Elijah needed to go where he was told to go, and that place was, it was a place of protection and provision. It was a place of protection and provision. And for Elijah, this school of deeper faith was now in full session. Think of it that way. And what would have, Eli- what would have happened to a- if Elijah decided to not follow these instructions? What if he would decided to go with his own gut instincts? What would have happened? Right? Probably wouldn't have worked out so well. What if, what if he didn't go to the brook? Right? Who knows for sure, right? One thing's for certain, he would have missed out on the Lord's protection and his provision. I think that's a great reminder for us. When we don't live as God has told us to live, we live outside of his protection. We live outside his provision. Don't be boo-hooing and whining about how God hasn't provided for you. Right? Don't, don't be boo-hooing and whining about how God isn't protecting you from this evil. Right? Don't, don't, don't be whining about how God's not, not living up to his end of the deal. I think God keeps his end of the deal every time. Right? We're the ones who don't hold up the, the end of the bargain. We, we live on our own. And so the lesson for us from Elijah in, in, this, in these couple of verses, always follow God's instructions regardless of how strange or counterintuitive they may be. Right? Always follow God's instructions regardless of how strange or counterintuitive they may be. Because how many times have we missed out on God's provision? How many times have we left God's protection? How many times have we things passed us by because we failed to do what God had told us to do? 
right? He's like, nah, surely, surely that's not what God didn't mean that. He didn't really mean for me to go there. God didn't really, why would God have me resign from this position? He don't want that. Why, why, would he, why would he ask me to take this new job at this new place when I'm perfectly content at this place? I must, my, my, I'm not hearing him right. Yeah. God may have had something for you at the other place. Right? He had a mission for you at that other place, a new assignment, and you missed out on it. Right? Think of it like this. Uh, have it your own way only works at Burger King, not with God. And last time I checked, it only worked at Burger King anymore. Right, <laughs> right. So uh, let's let's be people that follow God's instructions completely. And the last thing that, that that we see, the last lesson that we see from Elijah for this week, is that God uses unexpected means to provide. From verses four through seven, God uses unexpected means to provide. It says, and it will be that you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and stayed by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and, the, and he drank from the brook. And it, and it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. So have you ever had God just blow your mind before? I mean, just, 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 you know, just rock your world. You just knock your socks off with, with, with who he is and, and, and how he works. You know, has, I mean, has he just really shocked you in the way that he worked things out before? Have you ever got that? Have you ever had that experience yet? If not, I pray. I pray that he'll do it for you. Now, I'm going to give you a little, let you in on a little something. Uh, might be some pain on the front side. I almost promise you there'll be some pain on the front side. But the blessing on the on the back side uh, is, is well worth it. That that we'll learn when God does these things. You'll see him move and, and you'll grow in your faith tremendously. I'm confident that Elijah was shocked by how God would provide for him while he was hiding in the wilderness. But God would provide. Right? Ravens? For real? You're going to have birds? You're going to have birds? Birds of, you know, scavenger birds? They're going to be the ones that provide for me? Gross. Right, that's kind of what's going through his mind. He's thinking these things, but uh, the truth of the matter is that God provides. He'll provide in some strange ways, and God knows a thing or two about providing for people when they're in the wilderness. Right? Right? We think of the Israelites wandering around for forty years. Should have been forty days, but turned into forty years because of their grumbling and complaining. Right? He provided manna for them uh, for all that time. So the judgment that Elijah pronounced against Ahab would also have a direct impact on him as well. And that's a whole nother sermon, right? Sometimes, you know, being right or, or being, uh, bringing the truth is going to affect you negatively as well, right? You know, there's going to be some fall out there. No dew or rain meant no dew or rain for anyone, <laughs> right? And when he, he said when there's no dew or no rain, that, that meant him too, right? There's going to be nothing. So when he brought this judgment, it was going to affect everyone. But God was going to teach Elijah that he could be trusted to provide I think that's what's kind of neat whenever. I don't know if Elijah thought it through or not. We're just speculating. But when, when he said no rain or dew, I don't think he was imagine. I don't think he thought it through as far as what about me? What, what about me? What am I going to do to drink? He's just being obedient, you know, and operating on faith to do what God had said. But God was going to teach him. He was, this was a lesson that he was going to show him because he would need to be able to trust God fully down the road in the days to come. Elijah would need to have unfailing confidence in the Lord for the task that was ahead because he had a showdown with the prophets of Baal that was headed his way. And he needed to have full assurance that God would provide for him then. So when we think about these birds, ravens, uh, what comes to mind for me, I think of like Edgar Allan Poe, uh, some type of like a creepy novel, or even if you're a sports fan, like the Baltimore Ravens. And I think it's all this kind of a thick uh, black bird with a thick beak on it. And, and basically it's a... Uh, 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 it's a scavenger bird that, that feeds off the carcasses of dead animals. It's kind of like, we, you know, a mini vulture or buzzard like we have around here, I guess. We don't have ravens. We have these big, nasty uh, vultures around here. Uh, but they were very common in the mountain areas around Gilead. And so uh, that's what God used. He didn't, like, bring in some outside sources. He just used the natural resources that were there, the water that was in the brook, and then we have the ravens that were there. 
So uh, just another little side note for Elijah and for us that God not only, not only has authority over the rain, but he also has authority over the birds of the air. Because these scavenger birds they aren't about bringing, bringing their food to some human. If you know birds, what, what do birds tend to do when you, when you come near? They take off, right? They're not real, real big. They're kind of scared of humans, and rightly so. They see us as being predators. And so uh, all of this has a supernatural thing about it, uh, and that's all pointing to God and his way of provision. Right? He, he made them, the, the, talking about the ravens, uh, go against their nature and provide food for Elijah. Right? And it wasn't just meat. Which was, was, was normal, right? Uh, bread was added to the menu as well. So here, we're not sure where they got the bread from because, I mean, the meat, that's a natural occurring thing. They could have got that from scavenging or whatever, but bread, that's not a natural occurring substance in the wilderness, right? So either uh, we don't know, again, just speculating that, that God may have provided a manna type bread for the birds to bring to, to Elijah, or maybe he commanded the, the, the birds to go into the villages and, and, and take. From, from the townspeople, their collection of bread. We don't know, but the point is that God provided for him meat and bread both for this time uh, while he was in the wilderness. Twice a day he got this. So he was well resourced. He didn't go hungry uh, while he was hiding out. And so this brook, the brook Cherith, uh, this one brook continued to have a flow of water while the others dried up. Isn't that kind of peculiar? Right, the rest of them are already getting all got getting the big cracks in them and running out of water, and this one's the one that keeps on running, way beyond the rest. You think that's a coincidence? Right? I don't. That's God again. God, God's the one who's making sure that that one stream, that one brook, is the one that the water continues to flow in. But Elijah had to be at this specific brook to receive to receive God's provision. Right. If he would have went and decided, well, this is a brook, this is good enough, I'll stop here, I'll camp here, and I'll hold out here, he'd have been on his own. Right? Again, we wouldn't have, this story would have had a, a much different ending. And just as a note, of course, when God's time to, to move Elijah on to a new task, the brook dried up. Right? We see that at the end, right? The, at the end of, uh, at, of verse 7, it talks about that. The brook dried up. And for us, uh, God will do the same thing for you and me. Sometimes our brooks dry up. Sometimes a season comes to an end, believe it or not. Right? We'll have to be willing to move on to a new work when the Lord has, uh, has, uh, has time for us to move or the Lord has to uh, move us on to something different. What once may have worked and had great effectiveness doesn't work anymore. Right? And I think we can all identify with that because uh, you know, it's a sensitive subject, a touchy subject. Because lots of things that, we, that, that we've known in our lifetimes, maybe uh, ministry tools or evangelistic uh, techniques, had great effectiveness at one time. And, and maybe many of you came to faith through those great techniques and great means. But they're not working anymore. They're not working anymore. They're not effective anymore. So we have to be sensitive to that and be willing to, to do some things different. We talked about it in the discipleship time tonight. The message does not change, but our methods change. Right, We're, this ain't the same culture that you grew up in. Then this isn't the 1940s anymore. This is the 1950s. Things are different. People do things different, right? And so we have to be willing to accommodate and, and, and compromise in those areas, but not ever, ever, ever compromise the message. Right? That's the difference. We need to be open to trying new things when the old ways aren't working anymore. It's kind of like trying to stuff that square peg in a round hole. Right? Keep on chopping away. Sometimes we're working ourselves to death, but it, it, just, it just ain't happening. It's time to try something different. Give it a shot. What, look, if we try something different and it don't work, what do we lose? Nothing. And you can, you can point your fingers, ha, ha, brother, I told you that wouldn't work, and it didn't. We're well, good. Good for you. You were right. Right? You win. And we'll go back to trying the other way. And, and, and whatever. We have to be willing to be flexible is all I'm saying. Because, because a season will come to an end. And we have to be willing to adapt. Or, option two, we can just keep trying to get water from a dried up creek bed. Right? Keep on going after that same old dry well that hadn't produced water in a long time. Right? And keep wondering, well, I don't know. I don't know where the, what happened to the water. I hadn't, I hadn't had water in a long time. And you keep sticking that bucket down there expecting for water to show up. I think that we need to be sensitive to God's leading. Sometimes he'll move us on. That, that creek will dry up and it's time for a, 
a new season of ministry, a new way of doing things, a new way of thinking. So our final lesson from this passage is that God will provide for us in ways we would never expect. Right? Don't get locked in. Don't put God in a box. And I, and I tell you, uh, just, to, just to I'll close with this, a personal testimony for me. Uh, whenever I was waiting for, for God to, to, to place me in a church, and uh, I've shared with y'all before, I got, I got very discouraged. I thought for sure that, you know, I, I figured as I waited, you know, to finish seminary, to, to, to pursue a, 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 a church, to pastor, that God was going to bless that. Right? He's like, right, you know, good for you, Mike. You, 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 you've stayed the course and, and you've been patient. And surely, you know, you graduate December 2012. Man, we're going to have you in a church in, in, in February. Right? You know, you graduated, boom, 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 we're going to move you right along. Uh-uh. Nope. It's about a year and a half I waited. And that was a long year and a half. And, and in a, the big picture, that's, that's nothing. A year and a half, what is that? That's a short time. But for me, it was just, it was painstakingly slow. And, and, and I would justify it. I will say I didn't wait a year and a half. There was five years I, I was working on my four-year degree. You can add to it. So really, everybody, it's six and a half years, okay? It wasn't just a year and a half. But I was very discouraged, and, and I was struggling with, you know, with those things. And uh, I got an email from a friend of mine uh, that, that uh, does book reviews and submits them to you know, authors. You know, he's, he, he likes to read a lot, and, uh, and, he, and he you know, reads a lot of theological books. And a, and a guy wrote a book. And he had submitted to him a review of it and, and kind of touched base with him and, and told him my story. He said, I got a friend, you know, would you pray for him? He's, he's pursuing ministry and he's, and he's discouraged and he's struggling. And, uh, and this guy, you know, kind of, you know, had a, a heart for, for where I was at and what was going on. And, you know, he, God used this total stranger uh, to, 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 to really, you know, kind of, you know, give me a big hug. And this, this guy... Uh, never met me before, just heard my testimony, and God used him uh, to kind of remind me who God was. You know, that, that guy contacted me through email and got my mailing address, and, and he sent me a, a copy of his book. And, and in the copy of his book, he sent me a check for $1,000. And the name of his book is Who's Your Father? Right? And talk about an affirmation. You know, uh, uh. Why well, I cried like a baby. <laughs> I'm going to do it again. Now, I was crushed. You know, I felt so ashamed of my thinking that my father had forgotten about me. You know, he hadn't forgotten about me at all. Everything was under control. Everything was progressing as it should. Everything was right on schedule. And so God used this man, uh, unexpected means, to encourage me. And it wasn't that long after that that I get a phone call from Kelly Perkins of Occupy Number Two Baptist Church. Right? So hang on there. Hang in there. Whatever you're going through, God ain't forgot about you. And he may use some unexpected means, something you would never expect. To accomplish his plan, his plan, his purpose. I, I saw this this quote this week from Hudson Taylor, who was a missionary to China in the 1800s, and what he said it, it was true then, and it's just as true today. He said that God's work, done God's way, will never lack God's supply. Hmm? God's work, done God's way, will never lack God's supply. So, in closing tonight. Just a quick review so, so you can take these home with you and apply them. Three lessons learned from Elijah in our passage tonight. Number one, God's methods aren't always what we expect. Don't put God in a box. Don't put God in a box. Number two, always follow God's instructions regardless of how strange or counterintuitive they may be because God's way is always the right way. God's way is always the right way. And thirdly and lastly, uh, God will provide for us in ways we would never expect because God hasn't forgotten about you. God has not forgotten about you because we serve an awesome God. Amen? Amen. And he has chosen to glorify himself by using us to accomplish his work. So let's learn to expect the unexpected with our God. Let's pray and we'll have a, a, a moment of response. Father, what a great, great 
testimony that we have in your word tonight. Father, forgive us where we, we have put you in a box, Father, where we think that, that we can train you or we can tame you or we have uh, you figured out. And Lord, uh, God, you just rock our world over and over again. And sometimes I feel that uh, you go just the opposite direction just to keep us on our toes. Father, we ask tonight that you would give us a ever-increasing faith, Father, that we would uh, lean on you, Father, whenever we can't see you working, that we would continue to, to read your word, Father, that we continue to pray and seek your face, God, and, Lord, that we would be open to anything, anything that you would have for us to do, God. Thank you for Elijah, Father. Thank you for your faithful example uh, that we have in your word. Lord, help us to to be strong. Help us to be men and women of faith, Father, as we see in your word. Help us to walk by faith and not by sight. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.